I appreciate the prayer, Mary. Some afternoons, Clarissa and I, uh, we like to watch Jeopardy. Uh, that's a TV game show where contestants answer, answer trivia questions from various categories. And we have noticed that when the categories involve Bible knowledge, the contestants often seem to have rather limited Bible knowledge. On one occasion, the uh, clue very clearly indicated Moses. So there's me and Clarissa both yelling at the TV, Moses, Moses. And the three contestants are going, <laughs> unfortunately, this is typical of the knowledge of the Bible in our culture today. It has deteriorated. Many biblical references will go right over people's heads. Now, there are some Bible references that people will still recognize, even if they haven't been in a church for quite a while. For instance, they will know what the story of David and Goliath is about. And they have probably heard of the handwriting on the wall. From the New Testament, they may have heard about going the extra mile. But there is one reference that almost everybody in our society will recognize, the Good Samaritan. And you find it in Luke chapter 10, where T Jesus tells this parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man. He passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. This story illustrates of what is probably the most profound and serious and difficult moral question that we will ask ourselves, which is, why should I care about what happens to other people? Why should I promote their welfare and not just my own? Well, you might think it's obvious that we should. I mean, after all, the Bible says we should several times in many ways. But we also have this built-in moral drive or instinct to care. This instinct is part of what's called the image of God, which is built into every human being, including you and me. God put it in us when he created people. But then we look around and we see how often it is that so many people don't seem to care about what happens to other people. And to be honest, sometimes we find ourselves acting like we don't care all that much about people who need help. That's because there is another moral instinct, selfishness. It is also built into every human being, including you and me. It wasn't God that put it there. It appears that Adam and Eve got it started with their original rebellion against their creator. See, that's what sin is, a rebellion against God. We decide to do what we think is okay. And, sometime, and somehow, this 
attitude of rebellion has been passed down to each of us. It's called original sin by some theologians, and there have been books upon books written about how it happened, how it gets passed down, and so on. But however it happened, there's no denying it's here in every one of us. It may come out in different ways, different times, but it's here. So each of us has this conflict between these two moral instincts. Sometimes compassion wins, like with the Samaritan. And then sometimes selfishness wins, as with the priest and the Levite. Now, we admire the good Samaritan. We don't admire the priest and the Levite. Something more basic in our hearts tells us that compassion is better than selfishness. Even as we feel the struggle between these instincts, somehow we want compassion to win. It's sort of like addiction. You know, you indulge in the addiction even though you know it's wrong. We will indulge in our selfishness even though we know that compassion is better. And if that sounds kind of messed up, that's the human condition. Of course, there is a more practical reason to prefer compassion. We don't want to live in a society where everybody is just out for themselves. That's just nasty. It would make life into a bunch of power struggles as everybody is trying to gain an advantage. And that's no fun. And frankly, a lot of us are aware that we would probably lose a lot of those power struggles. But we want to see some generous attitudes among people in our society. When we do see generosity and compassion, we praise it. And we try to hold it up as an example, maybe a little encourage more of them. If you watch the uh, TV news at night, the national news, all three networks at the very end have good news hoping to balance off the 27 minutes of bad news, I guess. But they usually champion or advertise something good that somebody did. Yet, we see there's a lot of selfishness around us. Um, there was a rather troublesome case several years ago in the Army. A group of officers were taking the annual physical training test and they had to score at least so many points in various exercises. And the last exercise was a mile run. And they had to score so much in order to pass the test. One of them, however, collapsed along the trail. He was down on his knees, holding his chest. At least a dozen men ran right by him, barely glancing at him. Somehow it was more important to get a good score than to help a fellow soldier. Finally, two men did stop and helped him up and got him to an aid station. I understand that he did survive, but it caused a lot of questioning and self-searching among, uh, among the army as the story spread around. And they were asking, is this really what we've become? Let's take a look at what prompted Jesus to tell this parable. That starts back in the 25th verse. On one occasion, an expert in the law, that's the scribe, stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this 
and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells the parable. When it says that he was trying to justify himself, that tells us that his instinctive compassion had not extended to everybody. His instinctive selfishness had excluded some people from the love commanded by God. He wanted a definition of the people he was expected to treat as his neighbor. Then the implication would be he didn't have to love the people who weren't included in that definition. Now, Jesus could have given him a direct answer and just told him there is no such definition. God expects us to show love to any of the people he made, anybody you can encounter in life. But Jesus knew that that wouldn't work. It hadn't worked with the scribe. You see, when you make that sweeping a command, it sort of peters out. We start looking for exceptions. When the command is that broad, it gets easier to ignore some situations and some people. But selfishness is always right there with us. Just knowing to the command to love your neighbor as yourself is not enough. The scribe knew the command. He repeated it from memory. Jesus was trying to get him to live the command by putting himself in the place of a neighbor. Now, as he tells the parable, nobody wants to be like that priest who passed the injured man without helping. Nobody wants to be like that Levite who passed the injured man without helping. Notice that Jesus says nothing about the reasons that, that the priest and the Levite had for not helping. But it's a safe conclusion that they were some kind of expression of selfishness. But this is Jesus' way of saying the reasons don't matter whatever they were. Now, it's significant that they avoided the injured man walking on the other side of the road. You see, when we don't want to think of somebody as a neighbor, uh, we put them at a distance in some way. You know, the neighbors are the people that are close by. The people way out there, well, they're not really neighbors. And if they're really out there, out of sight, they're not neighbors at all. So maybe there is physical distance, maybe some kind of emotional distance. Maybe we would emphasize some difference between them and us. The most common kind of distance is to tell ourselves that somebody else will help. Somebody uh, closer to them, somebody uh, better qualified perhaps. So here comes a Samaritan down the road. Now you talk about distance. This guy, the Samaritans, were from a different country than Jews. They were ethnically different. There was huge emotional distance because of hatreds that had built up since the time of Solomon. Centuries of antagonism between the, the Jews and the Samaritans. If anybody would be inclined to rationalize that well, somebody else will help this injured man, it was this Samaritan. He might think, well, somebody else will help him. Some Jew will help him. You know how they stick together and help each other. Instead, he not only helps the injured man, he is extravagant about it. First, he bandages and treats the man's wounds then he takes the injured man to an inn. Let's translate this to a modern situation. It would be like us stopping the bleeding of a wound. That's normal first aid, first thing you do. 
and then putting him in our car and taking him to the emergency room. Then he arranges for a motel room for the man and arranges to pay for a nurse to come check on his treatment. Now, I think that there would be above and beyond the call of the command. But then he promises to pay any additional expenses on his return trip. The help provided by the Samaritan was extravagant to an extreme. Would we have thought any less of him if he hadn't stopped to check on the man on the way back? No. If he just treated the wounds and gotten the man to the shelter, we would say he definitely showed compassion and mercy. He would have treated the man as if he were his neighbor and would have obeyed the command to love his neighbor as himself. Now, making the Samaritan the hero of this story drove the point home like a sharp knife. The scribe could not deny that what the Samaritan did was good, beyond good. Then Jesus switches the question around. In the 36th verse, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law, the scribe, replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now he could have asked the scribe, why do you think the Samaritan treated the injured man as his neighbor and treated him accordingly? But that would have played into the scribe's request for a definition of neighbor. Instead, Jesus asked, who acted as neighbor to the injured man? Not whether that man on the side of the road was a neighbor, He's asking whether the Samaritan was a neighbor. This changes the entire focus of the parable. It changes the entire idea of it, the lesson of this parable. By the end of the parable, of course, the answer is obvious. But it's interesting that the scribe could not bring himself to say the Samaritan. You know. Jews just can't say anything good about Samaritans if they probably could avoid it. Instead, he describes him as the one who had mercy. That's the neighbor. And Jesus used that answer to let the, question, to let the scribe know he's asking the wrong question. From the scribe's perspective, the question was, who is my neighbor? From God's pers perspective, the question he should have been asking, who am I? Am I the kind of person who uses the instinct for compassion to override the instinct of selfishness? If he is, then there's no distinction about the people who need help because it always comes from him. It's always about him, the, the scribe. When Jesus tells him, go and do likewise, he's not just telling him to go help the next person he needs help, even if he doesn't like the victim. Jesus is telling him to go and become the kind of person who is willing to help anybody without making distinctions, without trying to think that, well, some folks just aren't my neighbor. God recorded this passage in the Gospel of Luke for our instruction. The question Jesus asks applies to us. Who are we? I can tell you from personal experience that it's not easy to become that kind of person. The selfish instinct is powerful, and I doubt that it goes away in this life. But we can remember that God wants us to use the instinct that he put in us, not the instinct that mankind somehow put in us, put in all of us. Use the instinct 
the godly instinct for compassion. And we do that by asking the right question. Who am I? Let's pray. Lord, sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes Jesus has to hit us hard with it. Thank you for his wisdom. Thank you for his righteousness. Thank you that he came for us. In his name, amen.